Hello, this is a special episode. I got Chris Sherwood from Crosstalk Solutions. Hey, everybody. Chris is, hey, Chris, uh, if, if you don't know, if you've ever Googled free PBX uh, through Google or YouTube, you will find the first results. There's an entire great series of videos on free PBX done by Crosstalk Solutions. So he's the expert, and uh, he's going to offer some expertise here and help learn systems uh, move off of Ring Central. All I'll say is our love affair with Ring Central is over. We're moving over to free PBX. And uh, Chris is going to tell me what to do. I, I know how to load it, so I got that far. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yeah, absolutely. And and that's the thing is free PBX is, is, you know, it's really, really a great platform. I've been working with phone systems for close to 20 years now, um, starting back in the old legacy days, you know, Lucent's before they were Avaya and NEC systems. And like when they were, you know, they took up a whole room basically. Um, and, uh, and free PBX can blow the doors off of any of those systems. Uh, it can do absolutely anything that you would possibly want it to do. And that's why I absolutely love it. And it's a good open source project. Yeah, I, that's what drew me to it. So I, I did look and play with a few other things out there, and some of them had like slick interfaces, but it came back to being open source, excellent support. The community is big for this, and the yeah. extensibility and plugins and uh, is wow. Just there's a lot to it. Yeah. So. And the the development team. This is something that's kind of overlooked in a lot of open source projects. The development team is is fairly available. Right. Yeah. So like if you have a question or problem or an issue, um, they they do address those things, which is that's that's even you know, what I like those any open source project. It, you, you're looking at PF Sense, you look at FreeNAS because they have a business model around it. You get a good development team. And that's yeah. uh, that's an important aspect. This is a uh, I see Sam Goma logo down here at the bottom. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. Yep. And owned the, by Sam Goma. Yep. Yeah. Owned by Sam Goma. So you have a business model behind it where they sell some stuff that you can get and everything else. So I think that's a really important aspect of a good open source. It, you get the open source, you get the community input, you get the community development, and you have a business yep. model that will means someone won't go, you know what, I have to get a job and I have to drop this entire project. <laughs> right. Well, and like I said, they're, the Sangoma owns free PBX and they make their money off of, you know, a number of ways, mostly off of hardware. So if you're buying mm -hmm. their servers or their cards or their phones, um, but they also make money from the commercial modules. But that being said, the commercial modules add a lot of functionality to free PBX, but you can still do mostly everything that you would ever want to do with a phone system without a single commercial module purchase. So yeah, I, they just kind of simplify it. It would be the way yes. to put it. Yes, they enhance the uh, the functionality. And uh, so I've got this set up in a virtual machine. Uh, the install is absolutely painless. I'm not going to bore anyone with it. Put the next and yes your way to happiness. That's really. <laughs> and you yeah. have some. You have plenty of great setup tutorials on how to how to get this far. Uh, yeah, with it. I'm so actually. It's, it's funny because I did a series on 13 and never finished it, and now they came out with 14. So I'm going to start a 14 series likely in May. So I will be doing a new series on FreePBX 14. Yeah, I think the only error I got is a uh, mail queue error. I didn't do anything. I didn't know, and maybe that's what. Uh, well, we'll start with this. I, I have it installed in a virtual machine because that's convenient because I have mm -hmm. a nice virtualization server here to spin up and play with all the different things. And once I got this installed, I'm gonna leave it here. So. Uh, we can move this if we need to, right? Sure. <laughs> okay. So you can. So so two things. So number one on the virtual machine, um, I typically when I'm setting up for my customers, I don't typically do virtual machines. Um, I like to. Pr I prefer dedicated hardware for a phone system. I, that's what um, I want to move to eventually. I this is like we're in the playing with it phase, but well, we're probably going to deploy it in a virtual machine, and I'll get some hardware from you. Uh, I think that's a better idea as well. That way, if you're playing or rebooting or updating a virtual machine, your phones don't go down. <laughs> yes, no, for sure. Um, the reason being, though, is is a couple of reasons. Number one, with the virtual machines, it's very difficult to use any analog cards if you want to. So, ah. the PC, like uh, you know, uh, if you have a PRI or if you're trying to run some POTS lines through the system, it's not as easy to do it with a virtual machine. You don't always have access to the PCI bus. Right. Um, the other thing is that there's an additional layer of SIP abstraction between a for the virtual machines networking, the physical machines networking, and then the actual network. Right. You're adding kind of an extra layer in there. And SIP does not always work well with that if the virtual machine is not set up properly. Okay, so that's what I run into a lot. And that's kind of why I just say, hey, let's not do virtual machines is because like I have no doubt that you, Tom, know how to set up a virtual machine because <laughs> I've seen a ton of videos where you're setting up virtual machines the right way. That being said though, just like anything, 
it's a learning curve, right? So oh, a lot yeah. of people say, hey, I've got the virtual machine installed, no problem, it's working, but is it, right? You know, is it really yeah. set up right, you know? And so that's where we run into a lot of problems, especially with voice over IP, since it's a real-time communication, the networking has to be perfect or else you're gonna have call quality issues. Yes, that's a that's a really good distinction because you're right though, if there's that little bit of uh, jitter in there, you notice right away with UDP yes. packets. There, you, you, the call quality goes to hell. And <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, so, I was working with a customer um, just yesterday, in fact, that has a sonic wall. It was like a TC300 or something like that. And sonic walls are notoriously bad at handling voice over IP. They slow down packets as it goes through the sonic wall uh, or, or just like, you know, removes RTP streams and does all sorts of weird stuff by default. So sonic walls are very tough to work with. And the guy contacted me, he's like, listen, I'm, if they're having jitter, they're having delayed audio problems, that sort of stuff. I said, what's your firewall? He's like, sonic wall, blah, blah. I'm like, oh yeah, yeah. Well, there, there's your problem is the sonic wall because I hooked two phones up to his hosted server. He had a hosted server in the cloud. Perfect audio, perfect audio for me. And I'm, of course I'm running, you know, a USG over here. So yeah. uh, it was fine, but the sonic wall stuff was no good. So he's working on that, but some firewalls are better with voice over IP than others. Yeah, uh, and PF Sense being one of them, that's uh, really good as well. You can set, I so, yeah. you can set priorities. You can set. Uh, vo it has by default the wizard in PF Sense has uh, voice queue support. It yeah. recognizes voice and our IT and can give it and can give it prioritization. And the wizard is like next in yesterday to happiness on it. So that's, it's, that's perfect. Yeah. Well, speaking of firewalls, so a couple of things before we even get into the free PBX, um, you know, firewalls are a big issue. So. Um, the two things that you want to make sure are sort of, you know, adjusted on your firewall from the default settings are typically you want to disable any sort of SIP ALG application layer gateway services. Okay. Because they basically just mess with your NAT, mess with your SIP. They're supposed to make it easier, but it doesn't. Um, and then oftentimes you will want to increase the UDP timeout value to 300 seconds or higher. Okay. Um, a lot of times the UDP timeout value will be set to 60 seconds, which means that it's going to cut off an RTP stream at exactly one minute until that RTP stream re-registers or does another handshake. So that means that you'll be talking on the phone and in exactly one minute, your conversation stops. Got so it. those are two sort of tips for the firewall. As far as ports being forwarded through the firewall, don't do it, right? Try Do the best you can to avoid opening point ports in your firewall through to the free PBX server at all costs. There okay. are ways around it. There's VPN. If you have to open up ports for a provider, you need a firewall that can lock down that provider's WAN IP address. So only they have access into the ports that you open. Yes, and that is an option. You can set the source uh, in PFSense. Uh, yes. That is an option on there. Um, we uh, PFSense also supports one-to-one uh, -one on the outbound, so you can make the mm -hmm. outbound port match incoming. I know some, I don't know, is this is something we, you run into with any of the deployments with free PBX where they have to match the outbound ports? Typically not. Okay, good. Yeah. That was a, 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 another unmentioned uh, product. That was something that was actually a requirement. Uh, they, they actually had a mapping for PF Sense. They had a work instruction. It's kind of extensive, and I don't see many things that need that. It's, it works like the old Ike, uh, IKE firewalls. You had to have outbound 500 in and out. You couldn't go out on a higher port number, and that's how they want you to configure all that. I mean, it was, yeah. So I'm glad PrePBX doesn't need that. That just simplified things a lot. Yeah. <laughs> Well, let's get right into it then. So okay. you've gone through the wizard and like I said, the wizard will set up your um, the responsive firewall. It'll set up some of your NAT settings, but I like to go back and double check sure. all of that stuff manually anyways. Absolutely. Um, so let's start with um, a couple of things. Well, first of all, notice that right below, welcome to free BBX, it says VoIP server. Mm -hmm. Let's personalize this for you, right? So I'll go settings and advanced settings and then scroll all the way, almost like three quarters of the way to the bottom. Most of this stuff you will never have to touch, but I always change this because I'm dealing with so many customers. There it is right there, VoIP server. Uh, LTS VoIP server. There you go. 
dealing with so many customers, it's nice to uh, see a name. It, yeah, exactly. And then right two two fields above that is the time zone. You've already got it set correctly, so you're good there. But I always double check that the time zone is set correctly. Yep, I like that they actually have Detroit listed as a time zone. <laughs> yeah. So submit, and then you'll notice when you hit submit that you're going to get that red apply config button. Um, this is like you know queued changes. You don't have to hit apply config after every change. You can you can do it just every so often. Yeah, when, but when you're ready to actually commit them, that's the essentially the commit button. Correct. Uh, so now let's go settings and asterisk SIP settings. All right, asterisk SIP settings. Now there's a couple of things in here. So this is gonna be your NAT and firewall stuff. And of course there's your WAN IP. So we're gonna to wanna to block that out of the video, right? Yep. Um, but what you can do here, this is already done for you through the wizard, but you can just hit detect network settings. And then right below that, under local networks, you want to add every single LAN IP address or LAN subnet where phones are going to be connecting from. Uh, should be just these. Oh, we put the slash 24 over here. Yeah, exactly. So there you go. So that that is that will now properly manage NAT for you, right? So the, it knows that your external IP address is that. And then it, it knows, knows that these are your two LAN IPs where if you're going out to the internet, these should be matted properly. All right, and I'll go ahead and apply. Now, the next two tabs on this page, you see Chan SIP settings and Chan PJ SIP settings. Okay, so they're with FreePBX 14 and actually FreePBX 13, there are two implementations of SIP. I'm actually gonna change something real quick. Uh, yeah. This is actually nine now. I moved it to that IP. There so, you go. Well, you, well, could, you should be able to hit detect network settings and it should pick that up. Yep. Yep, it does. Cool. All right. That way it's um, just details. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, and it needs that. It needs that to be yeah. correct. So what, you know, that's the external IP address that the, you know, again, it, it all has to do with NAT and how the system yep. traverses the, your firewall. Um, so chance of settings, if you scroll down, you'll see that it's operating on 5160. Okay, yeah. so there are two there are two implementations of SIP. There's Chan SIP, which is the older sort of implementation of SIP, and then there's PJ SIP, which is the newer implementation of SIP. There's you'll get a lot of opinions on this. <laughs> okay. <laughs> My personal opinion on this is that I prefer to still run Chan SIP as on 5060, okay, as the main, the quote unquote main SIP in the system. The reason being is that PJ SIP works very well with phones, but it all, doesn't always yet work perfectly compatibly well with SIP trunking providers. Okay? okay, so if you have PJ SIP as your default, phones will connect just fine, but you might have trouble connecting out to a provider. Okay, so okay, because of that reason, I come in here and I change this to fifty sixty and I change PJ SIP to 5160. The caveat there is that you can't have both of them running at 5060. So change this to like 50, you know, 260. So change this one here. Yeah, 5260, right. save it. Now go to the PJ SIP tab. Do I have to hit apply or I can just? You just leave, you don't hit apply okay. yet. PJ SIP, scroll down 5160 on port to listen on. All right. Save it. And then go back to Chan SIP and now do uh, 50, 60 on Chan SIP. Got it. Now, here's something that is um, a little bit more advanced, and I know you'll love this. Let's open up PuTTY and an SSH window into the back end of the system. Sure. I'll even zoom it in for people. I created a zoomed profile. Oh, uh, beautiful. Plenty nice. of requests for this. <laughs> Um, okay, so yeah, SSH in. Um, certainly, if you uh, the, the default root password is Sangoma, all lowercase, um, certainly change that to something stronger yep. would be it, the first thing that you want to do. It has been changed, and I have my SSH keys in, so. Perfect. So now, um, there's so since we um, changed the SIP settings, we need to restart asterisk. So let's see if hitting apply config um, restarts asterisk. So do this first in the console. Go to, uh, don't hit it yet. Oh, oh. <laughs> that's okay. Uh, I was going to say, go to the console and do asterisk space dash RVVV. So that's triple verbose. 
And now we are sort of connected to the back end of Asterisk. Uh, oh, and lots of times when I'm working on a system, I just like to leave this up so you can watch it. And then you'll see calls going in. You'll see you know, if there's any errors that are happening because of calls not routing properly or anything like that, you will see those errors in this console. Oh, okay, so, cool. So it's good to really get to know and love the Asterisk console. Now, you did a uh, notice that when you change the, the SIP port uh, bindings, it you hit apply config, but it doesn't look like it restarted asterisk. Okay, so let's go ahead and just type exit. And then we're gonna use what's called the FW console command. That's, uh, I don't know what the FW is. It's not firewall, it's like yeah. free PX something console, I don't know. Anyways, so FW console uh, restart. Uh, is it dash restart or just, just restart? restart. Mm -hmm. Now, while that's, while that's happening, so this is just gonna restart all the services. While this is happening, there's a lot of stuff that you can do with FW console. So for instance, um, you know, in FreePBX 14 to update the system, this is actually new with FreePBX 14, you can just run yum update like any other CentOS or Red Hat based machine, which is really nice. Um, however, to update the modules, the actual software within FreePBX, um, you can do this. Well, actually let's not do it now because you had a ton of modules to update, <laughs> but it's, it's FW console space, just type it out, uh, MA for module admin, and then space upgrade all. Okay. And so if you run that command, uh, yeah, just one word, upgrade. Uh, oh, yeah, one like word. that? All right. Uh -huh. And so if you run that command, that will just go through and update all of your, con like go back to the dashboard in um, FreePBX. So notice um, right at the dashboard, it's gonna say you have like, Oh, it didn't say that. It said that when we logged into SSH, but you yeah. do have a ton of modules that need to be updated. Well, actually, that's uh, something I was wondering about because I ran the updates and uh, I ran them all. So it's weird when I SSH in, it says I have them, mm -hmm. but there seem to be updates. They're, they're done now. They were red and I checked. And uh, hit, Yeah, hit check online right there. Hit the check online button. Let's see what it comes up with. And it might, yeah, see, there's there's one. Online okay. upgrade available. Anything that's red there needs to be updated. Got it. Okay. So um, you can from here, like I said, you can from here just say uh, upgrade all and then hit process. Uh, but again, I like to do it via SSH because I personally, I think that's easier and I, you know, I'm a Linux guy. So yeah, that yeah, FW console MA upgrade all command will do it. Should, should we do it right now? Yeah, let's go ahead and do it. It'll take a couple minutes, but uh, we can do it. Upgrade all, make sure I got it typed right. So now this is just gonna go through, it looks for everything that needs to be updated, it downloads it, it, it installs it, it updates it. And it also does the dependencies. That's something that the, the GUI version won't do. So if oh. there's <clears throat> if there's a dependency, you have to run the GUI version multiple times, whereas this one you only ever have to run once. That's actually really nice. So it just grabs yeah. everything. Now, how often do you uh, recommend doing this? So when there's updates, because uh, obviously phone systems generally are the forgotten thing in the, yes. in the server room. <laughs> yes, they are. So I personally like to do it once a month. Okay. Um, so for all of my hosted customers that are using me for hosting their free PBX, we go through and we do their updates once a month. Um, <clears throat> you'll notice though, in free PBX 14, you can now schedule the updates as well. So uh, if you like to live on the edge, <laughs> that's something <laughs> that you can do as well. Uh, the problem with scheduling the updates is if there are any bugs, you know, I, I kind of like to just wait a little bit, you know, when new yeah. stuff comes out instead of automatically installing everything. Um, or to put it another way, when you manually install stuff, you will see if there's a problem versus if you, something happens automatically in the middle of the night, you're going to get there the next morning, there's going to be a problem and it might take you some extra time to figure out that, oh, the system updated and there's a bug from that update. Looks like we're done. Double yep. Up to date, everything done. Yep, there you go. You can also run yum update right here. So just do yum update space dash y. And uh, there you go, you're all good. Cool. Yeah, I did that. Uh, I'm not the biggest Red Hat guy, but yeah, right away when I get, I still at least ran all the updates on it. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm fighting my hands not to type apt get update. <laughs> I know, I know. It's tough going back and forth between uh, Debian and, and CentOS. But uh, so yeah. go back to the dashboard. You should see that the bind ports for SIP is now correct. All right. Uh, no, it's not. It says, oh, you know what? That's an old error. That's what it is. Just close out those two, uh, those two uh, green lines down there. Yeah, so it's, though, it is correct, actually. Uh, that is just, and you get that little warning on asterisk when it hasn't been running for more than 10 minutes. Okay. 
So again, nothing to, uh, nothing it's to always interesting to me, to me too. Look at the, the network usage. It always climbs up like that and then sort of evens off. I don't really, I never figured out why it kind of does that. Yeah. But it yeah, does it on uh, every 14 system. It's very odd. I can run uh, uh, IO top and maybe trace it out sometime. <laughs> so, okay. So we took care of your NAT settings. The next step is going to be your firewall. So let's right. go ahead and do connectivity firewall. Now, again, this should have already been set up by the um, wizard. Um, yep. don't, you don't need to rerun it. I'll show you how to do it manually. Um, there's only a couple of things that you need to check. So first of all, click on networks. And you're going to also want to add in that uh, that other network that you added. So it was not what I think it was 182.168.3. Yep. So scroll down to the bottom. New uh, network down there. It so was I see them up here. Uh, but didn't you have a 192.168.3.0 oh, slash 24 yeah. as well? Yeah. Yeah. So put that there, CIDR format, and then set it to trusted excluded from firewall. Okay. Local trusted excluded from firewall like that. And you can put a little note in there too. Sometimes I like to put notes in, like, especially if I'm doing a hosted system and I'm trusting WAN IPs, I like to put the notes in for whose WAN IP that is that I'm trusting. Got it. That way you don't lose track of that stuff. And you know, a year later when you go look at it again. Um, so go ahead and apply the, or save. Yep. <clears throat> now, one thing that you should know about the free PBX firewall, this is really cool. So I always put the free PBX firewall on, even if it's in a LAN that's protected by another firewall, right? So you're poking holes into it for your, basically your, your devices here that are on the local LAN, uh, but it still has that extra layer of protection, including intrusion detection uh, for anyone else. Okay. Now, I have locked myself out of the free PBX firewall more times than I care to admit, okay? Because it's a little, it's not exactly the most intuitive firewall in the world. It's yeah. actually gotten a lot better. If you ever do lock yourself out of the free PBX firewall, you can reboot the free PBX twice in a row. If the free PBX reboots twice within five minutes, it disables the firewall for five minutes after the second reboot. Okay. Okay, so then you can get back in, you can do what you need to do, fix the firewall and get yourself back in. Okay, so it's kind of a little safety net that they built in. Um, I've seen it had a fail to ban in there too. Uh, it does, which so is that's great. what we're gonna do next, right? So uh, let's go ahead and turn on the firewall because it's actually not on at the moment. So click on interfaces. And so right now we're trusting all traffic, right? We're local trust traffic. So put it on internet, default firewall and then go ahead and update, and that will turn on the firewall. You should also get a notice in SSH that the firewall is being enabled. It might pop up in a second. We'll check. Or not. Or not. <laughs> so, uh, okay, so let's pop over to... Let's see if it does anything in, uh, whoops, our log. Let's... Definitely change. It did make the firewall changes. So there's the push. Mm -hmm. So, all right. Okay. So the last thing we're going to do, and I'm not sure if you're going to have this or not, because it might be part of, I'm not sure if it's part of the, the, the non licensed system admin module. Um, but let's go to admin, system admin. Uh, there it is, intrusion detection. So, third one down there. Okay, so this is standard intrusion detection. Again, ban time, retry, find time. I usually do 3600, 3, 300. So that basically means if you have three failed login attempts within five minutes, ban the person for one hour. Okay, All right. down Let's at the submit. bottom in the whitelist, you're gonna to wanna to put your two LAN subnets in CIDR format, uh, the whitelist. Ah, okay. And this is another thing where if you're having trouble, where something's not connecting and you don't know why, check your whitelist, check your intrusion detection. Because <laughs> it's really you. <laughs> yeah, you'll see your own IPs on the banned list. And that's like, hey, wait a minute. How come I can't connect? Again, something I've done more times than I care to admit. <laughs> so, okay. So while we're in here, now this is the system admin. Uh, noticed all of the nice little tools that they have down the, uh, uh, the left, uh, right-hand side there. Yep. This is about half of the tools that you get when you have the commercial module installed. Okay. So the commercial, this is like kind of the basic stuff where you can set the host name, you can set the network settings and that sort of stuff. When you add the, um, 
when you add the sysadmin pro module or the, the sysadmin module, right there, by the way, this is where if you click on activation, this is where you see what licenses you have activated with your deployment ID. So your deployment ID is right there, 165-36608. Okay. Uh, it is hardware locked to this virtual machine. If you ever want to move it to a different server, you have to deactivate here before you do that, or you have to do it in Sangoma's portal online. Okay. So you have to like basically reset a hardware lock to move it to another uh, server. Um, so this is where you can see all of the licenses that you have. Currently, you have none. If you install SysAdmin Pro, which I recommend, it actually comes installed uh, or comes licensed anytime you buy a Sangoma server as well. Uh, it's like a $25 commercial license, okay. uh, that will give you more options for controlling the server, including a full email configuration where you can set up Gmail or SMTP so you don't have to do it in the back end, ah. the, right? So okay. there's a lot of extra tools that come with the sysadmin pro module and it's like 25 bucks. It's well worth the cost. Now you'd mentioned, I think before in your videos, there's like a bundle option. Is is that included in one of those bundles that I should get or? So there is, yeah. If you go to freeppx.org in a new tab. Uh, and then click on store commercial modules. Uh, there we go. So let's see, call center bundle. Yeah, scroll down though. There's a system builder starter bundle right there. Okay, so this one, 299 bucks. It does come with sysadmin pro. It also comes with, um, like I said, you can see what it comes with there. The thing is, I find that, so they reworked all their bundles about a year ago. Okay. And I personally have not sold nearly as many because the old bundle used to come with the endpoint manager and they sort of removed that and made it a separate product now. So okay. I find it's very rare that someone needs all of the licenses in this bundle to the point where it would actually save them money rather than just piecemealing buying them, you know, one at a time. Got so it. So just admin pro is 25 bucks. Okay. Uh, Page pro and park pro, those are kind of only if you need them, like, like page pro is really good for like school systems, things like that, because it adds the ability to do page uh, scheduled pages. It adds the capability to do valet pages, which is where you record what you want to say and then it pages after you record, it's not like live. And it also allows you to do multicast paging. So that's worthwhile if you're doing a lot of paging, but again, the paging that's built into free PBX is perfectly adequate for most people. Yeah. Uh, same, same thing with, with Park, Park Pro. Pro. There, there is a parking, parking system in Free PBX, but, but you only get one parking, one parking lot. lot. So, so like, if you have multiple buildings with receptionists in each building where they each want to have their own separate parking lots, that's a situation where you would then want to upgrade to the Park Pro commercial module. Okay. But yeah. again, most Not people use cases don't for us. This. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's what I'm saying. Like, so, so is it worth spending two hundred ninety nine dollars on it for you guys? Probably not. No. Uh, if you needed like the majority of the modules that are in that bundle, you will save money with the bundle over buying them separately. But again, I find that most people don't need that many of those those modules. Okay, this makes a lot of sense. So probably I should just buy the sysadmin pro. Now, we should, do we do that now or should this be a later thing and we'll muddle through without it? Well, let's go ahead and muddle through without it. If okay. we run into a situation where we need it, it'll be a good learning experience. All right, no problem. <laughs> um, so. The other commercial module that we sort of talked about, and it kind of leads us into the next topic, which is like, let's start setting up our extensions, right? So the next commercial module is the endpoint manager. Now it's not included in any of the bundles. Uh, I think it's $149, uh, something like that. What it gives you is the ability to provision your phones or, or, or create templates for your phones. So like if you have a receptionist phones, you got three receptionists, you can set up their phones and the buttons on their phones and you know that sort of stuff in a template and then apply that template to the MAC address of those phones, okay? Otherwise, you're setting up everything manually. Now, let me tell you, uh, with Sangoma phones, you don't have to pay for the endpoint manager. They, that's it. one of the benefits of Sangoma phones is they let you use the, the, the uh, what's called the phone apps, which are buttons that can run applications on the phone, like visual voicemail, follow me, you know, call flow control, these sorts of things um, right on the phone. Uh, that's one application that you get for free with Sangoma phones. The other one is the endpoint manager. If you don't have 
Sangoma phones. Like you have mostly Yay Lynx, is that correct? Yeah, a couple of Yay Lynx, because we've got the wireless ones and we have uh, some Cisco phones laying sure. around. So Cisco phones and Yay Link phones can both be configured with the endpoint manager, meaning okay. that you basically put in the information about that phone, da, da, da. Now, um, I, you said that you have the Yay Link uh, 5X phones, the newest, newest ones? Yeah, the, 50, the new <clears throat> model, that 56P, uh, I think the same one you just did a review on. Uh, oh, the, oh, okay, that's the, um, the cordless the, uh, decked handset. Okay. Yep, the deck handsets. So that is in the endpoint manager, but I know that some of their newest, newest, like the big video display phones from EA Link, I don't think those are in yet, um, but it will do most of the phones okay. out there. You, If you Google uh, free PBX endpoint manager supported phones. They got a, a list. Whole, yeah, they got a whole list. It's uh, You can see all of the ones that are supported. Now, here's what I say with the endpoint manager. If you have more than a handful of phones, it's worth it. Okay, uh, more than a handful of non-Sangoma phones, it's worth it. Um, but I've had situations where, for instance, we sell, you know, Sangoma just came out with their own decked handset, but before they came out with that decked handset, pretty much the only option was that Yay Link. It was the best one on the market. So we would sell like, you know, 30 Sangoma phones and one Yay Link decked handset, right? And in that case, Eh, not worth the 150 bucks to do right. the endpoint manager. Just set up that one phone manually, or like, or like we'll sell 30 Sangoma phones and one, uh, you know, Polycom conference room phone. You know what I mean? Something like that. And then again, in that case, just add, just set up the one phone manually. But if you have a bunch of phones that you're managing, definitely get the endpoint manager because it saves you so much time from an IT administrative standpoint. For instance, if you have 30 phones deployed, all connected to the same template, and you just want to change one button on all of those phones, you can go in, change the button, save, apply, and update the phones, meaning that the phones will pick up that update automatically and reboot if they have to. Okay. Whereas, otherwise, you're sending someone around to go around manually to each of the phones, <laughs> and, and you'll log into their GUI and put in the button, and then, of course, you know, from an IT administrative standpoint, over time, that's going to get really messy. Yeah. Yeah. So you definitely, it's uh, definitely advantageous to get that. If I if you're so. deploying, you know, 30, 40 phones. <laughs> yes. And uh, you think about it from the perspective of remotely managing um, free PBX, it's also worth it to do it because, um, you know, you can get in, even if it's a hosted free PBX, you can get in there and make changes to their phones anywhere in the world. Uh, just by you know using the endpoint manager, so I I can't talk enough about it because <laughs> yeah. I really love it and we use it absolutely every day um, for for managing our stuff. Yeah, well, you're deploying a lot of phones, so it makes a it makes a whole lot of sense to mm -hmm. <laughs> to get that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, so let's talk about extensions then, because that's really the next step. Like once I've kind of got now, you have sort of the foundation, your NATs properly yep. set up, your firewalls set up. Uh, and notice that we have not locked ourselves out of the system, so that's good. Uh, so far. <laughs> so the next thing is to, let's go ahead and pop in some extensions. Now you said you already put in your own extension? Yeah. All right, so let's go to that, Applications Extensions. All right. Yep, I hear Ring Central calling. They're like, yeah. what are you doing? <laughs> They're keeping an eye on us. So notice that your extension was set up as PJ SIP. Yep. So the first thing that we want to do, let's go ahead and swap that over to ChanSip since we made that ChanSip uh, change. Now, sure. if you had um, if you had done the ChanSip port rearrange first, uh, this would have likely been a a, a ChanSip extension on um, fifty sixty, right? Yep. So let's go ahead and go over to Advanced, and then hit that button, Change to ChanSip Driver. Blue button right there. Right, yeah. yeah, the big button. Uh huh. Yep. All right. Okay, and apply that one. And now your now your extension is chance zip on port fifty sixty. And again, that is something that each person should figure out for themselves. If they want to try PJ SIP, leave it on the same ports, whatever. This is how I personally do it. And Tom, I know you're a tech guy, so you know you can play around with PJ SIP and kind of get into it and figure it out. I just know I like to do what works. That's I'm very much for that. That's uh, <laughs> that's very true. <laughs> yeah. um, okay, so easy enough here. You got your name. Um, if this extension, if you want this one extension to have its own different caller ID, you can put that there. There's your SIP password. 
Um, down at the bottom is your users. So there is a distinct difference in free PBX between the extension, the device, and the user. Okay, so those are kind of two separate things in free PBX. Um, the user is fully permissible. There's a full permission system where you can set up, you know, users have access to see other users or see different contact directories or join different conference bridges, things like that, right? In most cases, again, I deal with the SMB market. In most cases, we are not doing user-based permissions in the PBX. It's most often that we just have one big user group for everyone. Got it. So this is uh, my user is going to be user 103, and then this is the password for that user, like the default. Yeah. And correct. I can then yeah. change it. And that's correct. for this? That's correct. The user okay. control panel. Um, and it's also if you go to admin user management, you will see all of the different user settings. So let's cover that next, though. I don't okay. want to jump around. Oh, no problem. Too. Just confirming. <laughs> it's hard to follow if you, <laughs> if you yeah. start bouncing around all over the place. So <laughs> the next tab is voicemail. All right. Uh, voicemail tab is pretty self-explanatory. Turn it on. Yes. Um, now, one thing you have made, you have made the uh, a very common mistake. Uh, you have entered in your email address twice for email address and pager email address. Or ah. did you do it? Oh, did you do a quick setup extension? Uh, yes, I yes. It was so like a wizard. The quick setup extension wizard will do this where it puts your email address in twice. Uh, if you do this, you will get two emails whenever someone leaves you a well, voicemail. That's fixed. <laughs> yeah. So we don't want to do that. Um, now, the next setting there email attachment. I usually set that to yes. That means that when you get an email that says, hey, you've got a voicemail, it also adds the WAV file of the voicemail as an attachment on the email. That's great. Yes. Uh, now, the setting that you are hovering over right now is the only other one that I want to talk about on this page. Me personally, I don't like having to check and delete voicemails in multiple places. Right. So when I get voicemail to email, I want to automatically delete that voicemail out of my PBX voicemail box. Okay, so I've got the WAV file delivered to me in email. That's all I need. Now, the caveat there is if your voicemail to email isn't working for any reason and you have delete voicemail set to yes, you are completely deleting any voicemail that comes through. <laughs> they are right, so, gone. <laughs> yeah, they're gone. You want to make sure that voicemail to email is working very reliably before you set delete voicemail to yes. That makes sense. Because otherwise, the system's like, nope, don't care. <laughs> so uh, it's something that I know is not in that other menu for the system setup unless we have the system uh, manager. Uh, where do we put a mail server in to get the mail out of here? Or are we going to cover that later? That's going to be in your, um, I, I forget what mail system is in the back end. It's, I think it's Postfix. Yes. So it's going to be manually configuring Postfix in CentOS. Got it. Okay. So without the uh, extra system uh, module, that's how you do it. Okay. Correct. Yes. So again, that's why, you know, that's sort of the value of these commercial modules, right? It's like, it's not that it's not possible to change your voicemail. It's just a hell of a lot easier <laughs> if you have the commercial module. Yes. I, I administered and still have a postfix server inside our building. So I've been using it for years, but yeah, yeah. it's, uh, uh, it's it's a lot of work. <laughs> yeah, well, and they also have like templates set up for if you're using Office 365 or if you're using oh, wow. email, right? So there's like sort of pre-configured settings for those types of mail services. Yeah, well. and we're using G Suite, so it's easy enough to, once I have access to those modules, re-modify it for G Suite, so. Yeah, I'll tell you though, the email is, even with the, the sysadmin mo uh, pro module, the email is one of the trickier things to get right. In, uh, in 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 the system. That's actually uh, have, why we have an internal mail server um, because I took the time to configure it right to connect to our G Suite. So everything locally that we have on our network emails the mail server. It trusts local network emails and does what it needs to do with them. <laughs> yeah, that's smart. That's smart. But again, you know, you have been in this business for a long, long yeah. time, and you understand how to do that stuff. A lot of people don't, right? And so, especially if you're um, just getting into free PPX or any any open source project. That and that's honestly, it's one of the things. Like, I, this is one of the things that that a lot of open source projects suffer from is the opinions of hobbyists. Yes, very much okay? so. So, so like people that get into like this. I've been working with free PPX for uh, probably twelve or longer, twelve years or more. Right. I still learn new things about it all the time. Okay, it's, it's extensive. a vast a vast, extensive project, and there's so much that you can do with it. So when someone gets in and they set it up and they like, oh, it's not working, it sucks. 
that drives me crazy, right? Because it's like, it's not that it's not working and it sucks. It's that you, you haven't passed that learning curve yet, right? So you just don't quite understand how to set it up yet, right? It's not that it sucks. It's a great project. Yeah. But you know, so anyways, I digress. Same thing with a lot of open source. If people get into it, they just, they can kind of get it working and then they like, they get frustrated and then they get a oh, yeah. the product. All the people that say things like, my game didn't work, therefore I hate it. Yes, right, exactly. <laughs> uh, okay, so here's your, uh, let's click the next tab. So the next tab is your follow me. All right, that's, uh, oh, up here. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm looking for like the next button. <laughs> so find me, follow me is the way to get calls, uh, distribute calls out to like your cell phone, right? So if you turn that to yes, uh, notice there's also calendar matching now, which is, I haven't played with that yet, but if you have like a Google calendar, um, or I think it's actually just, uh, what's the standard, the candle calendar standard? Oh, iCal. iCal. Yep. Uh, so if you have an iCal, I yeah, by the way, if you hover over any blue question mark, it'll give you information about anything. So there is calendaring built in now where like if you have all of your holidays set up in a cal like an iCal calendar, you can have the system route calls based on you know, the calendar dates, like if you're there or not, like for holidays and stuff like that. So kind of, kind of a neat little add-on. I haven't played with it yet, so I don't know exactly how it works. But uh, again, it's one of those things. It's just, there's so much to learn in this system. That's just something that I haven't learned yet. They even look at that. They even have a calendar match inverse. <laughs> but, yeah, that's that's pretty clever. But like, so if you're on, the, the notion here is that if you're on vacation or not, you could set it to calendar match yes, and then any day that's marked as a vacation in your calendar, it will automatically follow your follow me list, like send your phone, send your calls to your cell phone or something like that, right? So I like it. Fo follow me works like this. You have it enabled. Your initial ring time right now is set to seven. That's seven seconds, meaning that when someone calls you, it's going to ring your extension for seven seconds. Once that timer has elapsed, it's then going to ring your follow me list for the ring time seconds, in which case that's only one extension for 20 seconds. So now if you put your another person's extension or if you put your cell phone into that follow me list, a call is gonna come to your desk, ring your desk phone for seven seconds, then it's going to continue to ring your desk phone since you have 103 in the follow me list and it's also gonna start ringing your cell phone. Makes sense. That's that's actually stuff that I use a lot. I yeah. definitely have people, uh, that's my preferred ways. I'm not at my desk a lot. And well, I'm not at the office all the time. <laughs> sure. And to take it a step further, if you're utilizing the user control panel, like you have up there in the second tab of your browser, um, you can even set up the user control panel with away statuses so that if you are idle for more than five, 10 minutes, it automatically sets you to away, which then would automatically turn on your find me, follow me. The I notion see. being that if you go to lunch, you don't have to touch anything. After five minutes, your phone, your calls will start coming to your cell phone. Okay. Um, looking at it right here too, call confirmation. So is this the prompt? This is a very important setting. So when you have calls going to your cell phone, you don't want calls to go to your cell phone's voicemail box, right? Right. So basically when you turn on confirm calls, that basically, you know, when a call comes to your cell phone from free PBX, it says to you, you have an incoming call, press one to accept. Perfect. And so there has to be some level of human intervention to actually receive that call in your cell phone. Because if you're, if, if the phone system doesn't know when you know, your voicemail picks up, if that was you or your voicemail, right? So call goes to your cell phone, you're out of range or your battery died and your cell phone's off and it goes straight to voicemail, the phone system's just gonna pass that call as if it was an answered call. Okay. So, turning confirm calls on means that you have to press one to accept that call on your cell phone. And therefore it'll never go to your cell phone's voicemail box. I like that too. That way I know where that call came from and how it got yeah. to me. Cause lots exactly. of people have my cell phone number. Uh, so, <laughs> <laughs> and, and this is also a nice way to mask your cell phone number, right? Where yeah. you don't have to give out your cell phone. You just give out your extension. And if anyone says, Hey, what's your cell phone number? You say, Oh, just call my extension. It rings my cell also. And that's exactly how I do it. Now, where do yeah. I stick my cell phone number in here? Uh, right in the follow me list. So okay. right below 103. Uh, okay. And the only difference, and if you hover over the question mark, you'll see what I'm talking about. Uh, hover over, yeah, right there. So you have to put a pound after any external dial number. So you so put that's, it... that, uh, that is an internal number, so you don't need the pound. So just do a new line. Okay. And then type your cell phone number. Without A pound goes at the uh, end. Oh, okay, at the end. Mm -hmm. Oops. Make sure I blur this out. 
<laughs> yeah, <laughs> or I'll get a whole lot of calls. <laughs> and pound, yeah. Got it. Pound at the end. Okay, then you can save that. Um, the other nice thing, remember we were talking about the free PBX phone apps? Those are buttons that you can put on your phone that do different things? Yeah. So one of the buttons that you can have on your phone, and this isn't all phones, by the way, so this won't work with your Cisco's, but it will work with your Le your Yalings. Um, you can have a follow me button. Oh, so the okay. notion then would be that if you want to enable follow me, you just hit that button on your phone and the light changes color with, if, if follow me is enabled or disabled. So like if you're going to step out to lunch, you just hit that button, it turns on your follow me, and then when you get back from lunch, you can turn it back off. Perfect. Yeah. I like that. Um, so there's really nothing else in here that you might have to deal with. The only other setting, if you go to advanced, <clears throat> uh, if you go into advanced and then scroll down, see where it says NAT mode and it's set to no? Okay, yeah. Um, so if you're dealing with a hosted, a cloud hosted phone system, oftentimes you have to set NAT mode to automatic force both. Okay. Um, in order for it to actually register to that hosted server. Got it. Sometimes, and again, I don't ask me what the difference is, like why you need to do that sometimes and why you don't. <laughs> I just know that that's a setting that, you know, if you are having trouble registering to a hosted server, you need to set that to automatic ports both. Yeah, but because um, uh, our phones are all local on the network here, no big deal. <laughs> well, in theory. <laughs> um, so, so we'll go back up to the top and let's click on pin sets. So I won't, we don't need to configure anything here, but Pin sets, uh, pin set, there's an application or a commercial module called Pinset Pro, and it allows you to create different pin sets. So for instance, if you want to only give certain people the ability to dial internationally, oh, okay. you give them a pin code, and then they can you can track each pin code individually um, for who's doing whatever dialing. And then if you click on other, there's a few other settings like the ability to record. Uh, there's your endpoint manager settings if you have uh, Sangoma phones or if you have other phones, you can also set that in here, the MAC address of the phone that this extension is associated with, et cetera, et cetera. Um, iSymphony is a graphical um, sort of console, management console for the phones where you can see calls in progress. You can do like, you know, you can listen in on calls and that sort of stuff. I don't like iSymphony. There's a better alternative out there called the flash operator panel. It's much more cost effective and uh, in my opinion, it works better. Okay. Um, so I usually just de completely remove iSymphony from FreePBX. Uh, and then you've got a couple of other things. So extension routing, that's another commercial module where, um, like, let's say you had a situation where you're setting up a company that is two companies in one building. Like, the, you, we run across those, you know, yeah. every so often. Um, and you have some phones that you want to dial out as company A, and you have other phones that you want to dial out as company B by default. Like we're talking about the caller ID that goes yeah. out when these phones dial the outside world. You can use extension routing for that. So you can set certain extensions call as this number, other extensions call as that number. They go on different outbound routes. Now, is that different than, uh, in a general, the outbound caller ID? Is that different than that? Hmm. Uh, yes, it is. So in that case, you probably wouldn't want to set outbound caller ID here. Um, outbound caller ID is not used that much at the extension level. Um, it's, it would really only ever be used at the extension level if every extension has their own individual DID that you want oh, to okay. dial out as. Got it. Uh, in most cases, though, people just want to dial out as the main company number. Okay. So in that case, you don't need to set anything here. You would set that on either your trunk itself or the outbound route. All right, simple enough. Yeah. Okay, so um, so this is the extension itself. There's really three parts to setting up extensions. There's the extension itself, then there's the endpoint manager, which associates an extension with a physical device, so your physical phone. Uh, or alternatively, you can certainly just log into a phone and set it up manually. The things that you need to set up a phone manually are gonna be the IP or FQDN of the phone system. Uh, that's the SIP server, so to speak. Okay. Uh, you need your uh, username, which in your case is 103, it's the extension number. And then you need your password, which is secret right there. So that's your, yep. that's your user password. The next one up is the actual password. Okay. Uh, for the phone to connect uh, under secret there, the AA5B0, blah, blah, blah. Simple enough. Um, now, did you want to like manually hook up one of your phones right now? Yeah, I can go grab one real quick and plug it in. Uh, yeah, we might as well do it and get a phone up and running. All right, let me go just grab it. Just around one second. So here's the console of your Cisco phone. We're just gonna set this phone up manually. The first thing though I want you to do is go back to your SSH 
and get back into the asterisk console because I want you to watch for when the phone actually connects. Sure. Asterisk dash RBBV. Okay, so here you go. Uh, you can see, you know, if you just, this is anything that's happening in asterisk will sort of pass through this console, right? What we're gonna do is we're gonna lock this on top. All right. That should do it. Keep okay. above others. All right, cool. Great. Now, okay, so now in here, let's go ahead and set it up. Now, uh, this might take a couple tries because I haven't set up a Cisco phone manually in a <laughs> heck of a long time. Uh, we actually, um, believe it or not, we don't work with or sell or recommend Cisco phones in any way, shape, or form. And I'll be honest, I'm only using it because I have it. Uh, yeah. they, we have four of these that were we didn't pay for. Well, we did yeah. like forever ago. <laughs> I got them for like 20 bucks. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, SP, the SPA series are a lot better, but oftentimes we will get people who bought like a lot of 20 of like the 79 60s or whatever on eBay and they, they're they just having trouble getting them to work in 3PBX. And yeah, uh, the, 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 the line that I've said forever is that, you know, Cisco phones are um, notoriously difficult to configure, but at least they're terribly expensive. Yeah. <laughs> Right. So, uh, okay. So let's go ahead and just, yeah, scroll through some of these. I think we can, uh, I think we just click on extension one. I'm just trying to think of where we would put in the, no, that's not it. Just go to user. No, go to uh, phone. Screen saver enable. Where's the actual, oh, you're in, uh, you're in the user. Go to admin login, upper right hand oh, corner. Details. Details. Yeah. There we go. Okay. So now click on SIP. Sip. All right. Yes. So let's see. No, this is not. Oh, extension one. All right. There we go. Okay. So let's see. Sip port 5060. I'm trying to look for where we actually put in. Okay. So there's your subscriber information, uh, proxy and registration. I don't think that's where we put in the SIP server information. I think that's where we just put in the proxy. So go ahead and display name 103 uh, under subscriber information. No. Oh, okay. Uh, where, hold on. About uh, right towards the bottom there. Oh, right here. Display name 103. There we go. Or you can put Tom or whatever you want to put there. Doesn't yeah, matter. Yeah. Free, free PBX is going to handle this plane name anyways. Yep. The password is from Free PBX, so go swap back over to Free PBX and copy that password. Uh, that's the user password, so you want the one that's up oh, higher. Yeah, this that one. one there. All mm -hmm. right. Now I got to move this over a little more. Here we go. <laughs> okay, so paste that password. Auth ID is 103. User ID is 103. Uh, over on the right. Okay, let's go ahead and save those settings. Notice the SIP port, right, 5060. If you were using PJ SIP, in your case, you would want to change the SIP port to 5160 there. Okay. And here's another thing I don't like about Cisco phones. You have to <laughs> reboot them each time. Every time you uh, make a tiny little change. Yeah, so, I remember that when we set them up before, we're like, everything's a reboot with these things. Yeah, those and polycoms. Polycoms and Cisco's have to reboot every time you just breathe on them. Um, the Yealynx and the Sangoma phones, which are, are my two preferred uh, phone vendors, those you can do a lot of stuff without having to reboot the phone, which is really nice. And I may um, probably look at Like I said, I have these, and so we said, okay, we're going to try because we're moving off of stuff right now, and I can't use my Yealynx, so they're actively in use answering support calls right now yeah <laughs> uh but eventually we'll be moving the a-link store but i may buy uh for other desk phones i may get some of the uh, ones you recommend for sangoma these are old they work and but i, I want something nice with a headset and everything so yeah all right so now the next thing we have, just have to figure out is where to put in the sip server so uh let's click back into the cisco stuff um um, you know what, let's just put it under as the proxy and see if that works. So right under proxy and registration, just put the IP address of the server, and then let's save that and watch that SSH console and see if it actually connects. All right. <clears throat> so proxy is used a little bit differently than the registered, the registrar, the SIP registrar. Um, you know, there's situations where, for instance, if you're using a session border controller, um, or if you're using a Sangoma Vega and you're using the... Um, what's called is the EMP, which is where you can like recover from a satellite office internet failure, like that type of stuff. Okay. Where you might be registering the phones to a SIP server in a different location, but you're registering through a proxy server. Got it. Okay. And so like the proxy server can then hang on to that registration and do stuff with it. Um, so that's usually what proxy is used for, um, but we'll see if it actually works in this case to connect over to the SIP server. If not, we're just gonna have to find the SIP server setting somewhere. It doesn't look like it's connecting um, from what I no, can tell. It's it an initializing network is what it's on. It rebooted, 
Oh, and there we go. Oh, there you go. It did, it did register. It did. Look at that. Okay, so we can see Peer 103 is now reachable. Let's do a couple of commands in here so you can see. Uh, make that window bigger. Sure. Let me uh, switch back to the big zoomed profile. Okay, so do um, SIP show, SIP space show space peers, P-E-E-R-S. There you go. So 103, you can see status is okay, and it tells you the milliseconds. Uh, it's a little off the screen there, but it's the... Uh, uh, 11 milliseconds is what it's showing. Perfect. So that's that's a quick way to see if a phone is online or offline. Now let me show you something else. Exit out of the asterisk console and do asterisk space dash rx space and then in double quotes sip show peers. So it, uh, yeah, just right there. Yeah, sip show peers and then end quote enter. Okay, so there's how you get the same information, not from the Asterisk console. Right, make it cleaner looking, we'll do it. There we go. <laughs> okay, so within Asterisk console, you can, you're just running live commands and you can just do SIP show peers. If you're not in the Asterisk console, you can do Asterisk dash RX and then whatever command you want to run in double quotes, and it'll pull that information out of the out of Asterisk without okay. having to be in the Asterisk console. Um, the reason where that's useful is, for instance, you could now set up something that's monitoring the status of a PRI. Okay, so you could basically pull, you know, a PRI show span one is a command where you could see if a PRI is up or down, and then you can like awk or, or just grep out the information that you need from that command, and then monitor if it's up or down. Well, and I can see real quick, I'm building in my head ways I could set triggers off of this for notices and things. So that's Precisely. Pretty, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So it's really powerful, right? So, but in most cases, um, I'm just like troubleshooting. I just do asterisk dash RBVV, that's yeah. triple, triple verbose, and I'm just watching the console as stuff happens. Um, now, let's go back into asterisk RBVV. <clears throat> and uh, go ahead and pick up a uh, pick up the call and do the echo test, which I think is star four three. Look at that. Yep, so now we can see stuff happening. So this echo test basically just allows you to test, and the echo test is a free PBX like. You an audible sense of the latency between you and the machine that is running the echo test application. You may end the test by hanging up or by pressing the pound key. So from here, we do a just hang up, just hang up. Okay. Um, so, but the thing is, uh, basically, the echo test it, it allows you to. Um, the echo test allows you to, it's a proprietary free PBX application. So if you can get to the echo test, your phone is successfully connected. Great. Right? It's, a, it's, a, it's a nice way to just test if it's working. Um, and you know, a funny side story that uh, uh, that voice is Allison Smith. She's the quote unquote voice of you know the PBX gal, I think is what she calls herself. Okay. Um, I went to Astrocon last year in, in Orlando and I was sitting, uh, eating my dinner at the bar, you know, because the, the restaurant was full and I was by myself, so I'm not going to take a table. And she was sitting right next to me having a conversation with someone. And I was like, I know that. <laughs> You're the I, voice of the PBX. <laughs> <laughs> it was so funny hearing her just have a regular conversation when I've been listening to her voice in Asterisk for like 12 years. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> yeah. Uh, anyway, so there, there you go. So that, that all this information that you see here, this is basically a call in progress and all of the stuff that happens when you're making a call. Um, you don't have to worry about a lot of that. I mean, there's, there's, you know, it, but it helps I like that it gives you ways. all this debugging info. So if yes. you have to trace something out, I yes. have everything at my fingertips here. And this isn't even the debugging info. You haven't turned on debugging yet. Okay. <laughs> this is just the general <laughs> debugging. This is before we yes. get to the deep layers. <laughs> this is just the asterisk console. If you want real debugging, like Wireshark debugging, yeah, that's a different story. Um, okay, so let's. we have a phone connected. Um, let's go and check out the user manager now. So you have a user that's assigned with your phone. So a, a physical device, a phone can be assigned to a, an extension. Now, a user can have multiple extensions. Like you could have a soft phone on your desktop, you could have a hard phone on your desk. So, you know, you could have, that's why there's a difference between users and uh, extensions, right? Okay. A user can have multiple extensions. Okay, so just click edit on your, um, we won't spend too much time in here, but just click the little pencil icon there and, uh, and you'll see 
some of the settings that you can do. Let's just briefly go through the tabs. So here's like what groups you're a member of, because again, fully permissible, you can set up groups, you can add people to groups, the groups can be nested with priority, all that sort of stuff that you would expect, almost like full like Active Directory stuff. Yeah, there's quite a bit in here and I can put my full name and everything. So yep, here's, this is your contact information. This is going to show up in the contact directory on the phone. So like, again, going back to those free PBX phone apps, this is a really nice thing to have where if everyone's information is in here, uh, there's a button you can put on the phone that says contacts, you can hit it and anyone that's in the contact directory, all of their information is right on the right on your phone. It's also right in um, the user control panel. Now, another cool thing, not, notice at the very bottom contact image, you can put a picture of yourself. And then if you have a compatible phone like a Yealink or a Sangoma, uh, when you call people, your picture will show up on their display of their phone. Oh, that's nice. Yeah. So ni nice little uh, bell and whistle. Like a lot of the stuff that we do when we're setting up phone systems for customers are those bells and whistles, right? Little things like that that people don't typically wouldn't think about, but it's really nice to have. I'll give you another really excellent example of a bell slash whistle um, is with the Sangoma phones. And this is another reason I recommend them is just because you can do so much configuration with the Sangoma phones. Um, with the Sangoma phones, you can set it up so that if I have Tom, if I have your extension, as a button on my phone, meaning that like I can see the status of whether you're on the phone or not. Uh, that's called a BLF key or a busy lamp field. I can use the Sangoma endpoint manager to change that button so that if I just press that button, it will speed dial you. But if I hold it down for more than one second, it intercoms you. Oh, nice. See, so there's a nice little bell and whistle that people don't think about that's something you can only do with Sangoma phones. That's awesome. So let's go back into your edit your um, user again. So uh, just click through. So it, click advanced. Uh, so that's fine. This is just if you have different people that are in different time zones on your server, you can set up individual time zones for your users. Nice. FreePBX uh, administration GUI is allowing users the ability to log into FreePBX. And notice also visible extension range. So if you have admins, uh, IT admins and say you have a college campus and certain admins are only responsible for certain buildings in that campus, you can lock down what they can access in 3 pbx to just those extensions. Nice. Uh, contact manager is what, um, what groups are you a member of and what groups do you have visibility to see? Like, so it's just like you set up that contact manager, you can set up like external contacts, you can set up like, like a one, I use contact manager a lot for doctor's offices where they have all like the pharmacies in the area, we'll create like a pharmacy group. And then we allow everyone to see that pharmacy group so they can speed dial the pharmacies. Okay. Uh, stuff like that. Um, I simply don't worry about fax. I never run faxes through free PBS. So just straight up. Yeah, I'm not, I don't think there's a need for that. Uh, yeah. <laughs> we, we're seeing less and less faxes. I'm just happy about that. <laughs> right. Um, REST API, you don't ever have to worry about. Phone apps is this is, these are all the different buttons that can be on the phone conferences, cues, voicemail button. And so this is like, what phone apps do these users have access to? You can range them and drag them to inactive if we don't want to use it. Okay. That's right. Uh, VPN, this is whether or not your user has the ability to VPN into the phone system. Okay, so this is a really, really nice feature of free PBX. If you have a phone at home, Tom, like you wanna have an extension at your house, if you have a Sangoma or a Yealink phone, it can inherently download a, an open VPN configuration file onto the phone and the phone itself initiates a VPN connection out to the free PBX server. Oh, very okay, nice. Okay, so open, uh, open VPN can be, a server can be set up on um, the free PBX, by the way, Open VPN server is another reason why you would want the sysadmin pro app, a Got commercial it. module, right? Okay, so if you want to set up VPN, that helps you configure the VPN in the server. And then that phone just comes up. All you have to do is port forward. Um, uh, you're going to put me on the spot on the VPN port 1194? 1193. 1193. Oh, I was one off. <laughs> so <laughs> port forward 1193 through to the free PBX. And, uh, and then those phones can connect in. It's a really nice way of doing it. Caveat, I might be wrong. One of us, we'll have to do this. We, we, one of us owes you the other one to drink or something later because well, this, I, 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 I think listen, I feel I'm right, but. How would we ever know? How do we ever know? It's not like we have Google or anything. <laughs> so, you just open up Bing, you go to google.com, you search for Google, then you go to, anyways. Yeah. Uh, no, so, um, yeah, so uh, 
yeah, VPN, the only caveat with VPN is it doesn't work when you have more than one phone behind an external WAN IP address. Okay. Okay, so if you have more than one phone, you're gonna have to set up like a point to point, like a hardware VPN uh, over you know, to the server. Like if you have a satellite office with like five phones or something, you're gonna wanna set up an actual VPN. Home. And that's actually something I have. That's what the other network, so the dot three is our office network and the 70 is our VPN network. So. Okay, perfect, yeah. Um, user control panel is whether or not this user has the ability to access the user control panel and then what are they actually seeing in the user control panel. Uh, we could do a full two hours just on the user control panel. There's so much to it. And the new one allows you to create dashboards individually per user. And like you could set up your own dashboard for what you can see, what you want to see, et cetera. Uh, and then chat is just whether or not the XMPP chat in the system is enabled or disabled. Okay. On a per user or per group basis. So again, you can see there's a lot you can do with the user manager. And this is all, it just comes down to permissions. Like what do your, what permissions do your users have in the system? Very cool. But it's also one of those things you can kind of get lost in like the granular details. You know? so, I, I like that kind of the defaults are just inherit the, the overall permission. So you can just yes. set it and everyone by default is just gonna inherit the permissions. And, and just so for your information, much like any time when you're setting up users and group permissions, I very, very rarely edit individual users. I always default to editing groups and then you add users into those buckets. Makes a lot of sense. Yes, it just it's just like any time you're doing that with a radio server or Active Directory or anything, that's yeah. always the better way to do it. Yeah, I was saying Active Directory especially. I I wish there was, I don't know why, but we always, you've, undoubtedly you've run a suit. Lots of other IT people have some idea to set everyone's individual permissions right. as opposed to building group permissions. Just make your life easy. It's a management so, thing. <laughs> so we've got a, uh, and we don't have, uh, I don't have too much more time here. Unfortunately, I've got about a half hour left. So we've got um, we've got the a phone connected. We've got your base configuration in. Really, the next thing that we want to do is set up your inbound routes. Like, how do you want calls to ring inbound? Um, right? So we could just do a very simple inbound route setup. Um, and I'll tell you, one of the most simple things that we do is calls come in. Uh, we're going to put it on a business hours time schedule, right? Yep. And then we want to just send it to a receptionist. The receptionist has, you know, 30 seconds to answer a call. If the receptionist doesn't answer, it defaults to an IVR that has a number of options. Press one for this, press two for that. Or like the way I have my phone system set up, you call in, it goes straight to the IVR because I don't have a receptionist. I'm straight a receptionist. to the IVR is actually how we do it. Okay. So let's do that first. Um, first thing you're going to want to do is record some system recordings. Now, the way that I program and design IVRs is I do it in Visio first, right? So I, I bring up Visio or some flowchart, whatever program. I design the entire thing out on paper, quote, you know, quote unquote paper. Yeah. And then the reason you do that is because you have to design forward. Like, so design from a call comes in, what are we doing with it? And then program in reverse. Right. Okay. Because if the ultimate destination of a call is to go to someone's voicemail box, that voicemail box has to exist before you do the previous step, send to a voicemail box, right? Right. Uh, so if you want, we can draw something out real quickly on paper, or we can just kind of wing it. We, uh, just so you know, the, the only ones we have, we have our extensions, obviously dial extension. Uh, then we have a group for the uh, techs and a group for sales. And that's, that's it. Okay, well, so and an after hours uh, option. So that's, that's actually, it's all the options we use. Yeah. So, uh, and then you have, it's, uh, so what are your business hours? Uh, 10 a.m. till 7 p.m. Monday through Friday. 10 a.m.? Slacker, dude. I know. But hey, we're here till seven. <laughs> well, and that's why we have the after hours one uh, that's also a group, which in the short term just pointed at my extension. But yeah, it's essentially, it, it hunts down uh, me and one of the other technicians. All right, IVR open. And then we'll have an IVR closed. So it's a tech tech support group and a sales group. Those are the two groups. We'll say press one for tech support. Yep. Support is one and two is sales. Yep. That's Marvin, right? Yep. Press two to send your problems to Marvin. Yep. It rings me and Marvin's extension simultaneously and it's first to answer, which I see it's coming as sales. And as long as I know Marvin's not busy, I'm not answering it. <laughs> now, do you want the sales and support to be cues? 
Uh, yeah. I, well, that's that's why. How does how does that work for BFT? Are they so okay? So there's there's two ways to distribute calls to multiple people. You've got ring groups, and then you've got queues. So ring groups are basically a simple version of a queue, right? You basically put a whole bunch of people into the bucket. And when a call comes in, it just rings all those people for X number of seconds. And then if no one picks up, it fails over to a failover destination. That's the simple explanation of a ring group. That's how ours are set up now. A queue gives you a little bit more functionality. So a queue is more of like a call center thing where you have the ability to have either static agents that are always in the queue, or you can have dynamic agents where they have to log in and log out. So for instance, when someone shows up in the morning, they have to press log in on their phone to, in order to take queue calls from that queue. It gives you more algorithms for how are you getting calls to the different agents, right? Are you gonna ring everyone when you have more than 10 people? Not a good idea. Or are you, um, you know, sending calls to the least recently answered person? Are you just doing a round robin? Um, that type of stuff. So it gives you call distribution options. It gives you timing options. Send to a failover destination if people have been waiting in the queue for longer than X number of minutes. It gives you capacity options. Send people to a failover destination if more than X number of people have been holding in the queue or are holding in the queue already, right? So you just have a vast, a lot more options with a queue um, for what you can do. Yeah, and it's reading right now, I mean, uh, most of the time we only have one or two people in answering phones and it rarely ever goes to voicemail. That's that's enough for us. We just don't have that high of a call volume because most people message us. Uh, yeah, so, sure. So the, the simpler oh. one should be perfectly fine for what okay. we Okay, so we'll create two ring groups, uh, support and sales. Yep. And then we'll get to those in a second. And then what happens if either support or sales doesn't pick up the call? Like if uh, they let voicemail it go? box for sales and a voicemail box for support. Okay, so we need two general voicemail boxes. Yep. And the third option is the after hours, which would um, go to me and Steve's cell phone. So now, uh, do you have one IVR and you say something like, if this is after hours and you want to reach us, press blah, yep. blah, blah. Yep. So you could do it. So what we're going to do is set up time conditions, though. So you could have a different message that says, thank you for calling. Our office is now closed. Okay. Press one to leave a message for support. Press two to leave a message for sales or press three to call the on-call after That'll hours. That'll work. Okay. That, perfect. Okay. So sup. I'm drawing this out on a piece of paper, by the way, so that uh, so that I don't forget it. Yeah, no problem. And then, what does after hours do? Uh, ring cell phones, because it means we're not here. So okay, uh, go back to freepbx.org. Well, I take that back. You can, because of the follow me feature, you could have a ring my extension. That way, if I am here, because I'm usually here, we just aren't officially open. So I guess I can right. ring my uh, extension, and then it'll follow me. Because I always have follow me turned on. Yeah. So uh, go over to uh, freepbx.org uh, one more time. Sure. I do. I want to buy freebpx.org and see how many hits I get. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Go to store and commercial modules and do a search for um, VM notify or just search notify. Right there. It's under the system uh, model. Under there. Keep going, finding the next one. You want to find the, there it is. Okay, so click on that one. Read, read this one. You can configure voicemail notifications to monitor a mailbox for new messages. When a new message is left in the mailbox, it will call the recipients listed below uh, and until one of them accepts responsibility for the message. Okay, so, so this application is 75 bucks and I think it's well worth it for like what you do. So what you can do is basically say after hours, Press three to leave a message in our emergency escalation mailbox, blah, 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 whatever. They leave a message. And then you can see there it's 4101, 4102, and then external cell phone or external numbers. And then they have a comma one, comma two after them. That's escalating priority. Okay, so basically like, let's call these people first. If they don't answer within two minutes, we're then gonna start ringing the second priority people. Okay. And it escalates until you get someone who actually listens to the voicemail box and then once the message has been heard by someone, it stops notifying. Makes sense. Yeah, so really great. Uh, again, this is an example of something that would be pretty difficult to do in the system without this commercial module. So this is where they make their money, these types of little add-ons. And for 75 bucks, something like this, for like a business like yours. Oh yeah, worth it, absolutely.
Yeah. So again, just something to think about. Um, in the meantime, though, while we're setting up for our purposes, we'll just shoot it to a, to a voicemail box yeah. or something. Yeah, that's fine. Okay, so let's do some system recordings first. So go to admin and then system recordings down at the bottom. Now, there's a couple of ways that you can either, uh, so what I like to do is I use my good mic here and I record using Audacity into the computer yep. and then I upload the recordings to FreePBX. Yep. You don't have to do that though. You can just record into the FreePBX, into a phone. So if you uh, go to add recording, uh, type a name at the top. So we'll call IVR closed for instance. And then enter, we see where it says record over extension down below. Yep. No. Enter, uh, enter 103, and then when you hit call, it's going to ring 103, and when you pick it up, it'll beep, and you just start talking. All Thank right. you for calling Lawrence Technology. Our office is now closed. Press 1 for support, 2 for sales, 3 for after hours. Whatever. Thank you for calling Lawrence Technologies. We are now closed. Pressed 4 for after hours support. Hang up. I pressed pound. Is that or? Uh, I don't know if pound works or not. It, it um, hung up on me. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, that does work then. So now just type a name for the file that you just recorded. So call it like IVR closed again. I think it has to be one word though. So sure. use underscores or uh, something. Right here's where you record that. Huh? Yep. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, spell closed. Right there we go. Okay, and just hit save. <clears throat> Oh, no files have been added from this recording. All right, so it didn't like that. So hit cancel. Actually, hold on. There. Oh, there it goes. Yeah, now it worked. Okay, so if you hit play, if you hit that little play button, you should hear it. Thank you for calling Lawrence Technologies. We are now closed. Pressed four for after hour support. Okay, so let's say you didn't like that one. You wanted to re record it, right? So see the green text? Yeah. You can click any file above because you can nest recordings. You can put multiple recordings in a row. Okay. So it says click any file above to replace it with a recording option below. So click on IVR closed again. All right. Uh, right click. next to the play button. Yeah, there you go. Okay. Uh, no, uh, right there. Not the play button, but the uh, the actual words. Yeah, right here. Just click in that bar somewhere, like right now, right where it says IVR closed, right oh, above. Okay. Yeah. Click right there. All right, and you drag it. No, no, just leave, just click it. Why is it not going into uh it's like your icons change into a weird thing. I can move them. It's giving me the drag option. It doesn't, when I click uh, it, it doesn't do anything. So, okay, well, I'll tell you what's supposed to happen. Uh, <laughs> normally when you click that, it turns green, which means that if you now re-record or drag a new recording in down below, it'll replace that one. Oh, okay. okay. Versus, yeah. I see that way I could just re-record it. Yeah, and so then you re-record it here, and wherever that recording is used throughout the IVR, okay, it will automatically update with the new recording. Because sometimes you're going to use a recording in multiple places, right? And then you don't have to go through and like record a new one, and then go find where it was used, and then replace it. You just replace the actual recording on this system recording. Got it. Okay, that makes but sense. Good enough for now. Good we'll enough just, for now. We can always go back in and redo it. So let's yeah. add another one for IVR open. All right. So same thing. Uh, no, no, you got to do a new one though. So you pull the tab out on the right hand side. This one? Uh huh. All right. And just say add recording. Oh, this is handy. And now we'll call this one IVR close or IVR open. All right. And this is the press one for sales, press two uh, for support or yeah, whatever. One you for want. support, two for sales. <laughs> this yeah, is why exactly. we write it down, right? <laughs> That's why I write it down. <laughs> My system, I seems like I would know this, but I'll call it real quick and I'll just record it real quick. Oh, I'll do these better later. This yeah, exactly. For, these uh, are temporary. Yeah. Thank you for calling Lawrence Systems. We are, that doesn't matter. Press one for, <laughs> press one for support <laughs> and press two for sales. Thanks. <laughs> I think you should leave that one. I should. All have right, now funny. put a name. Uh, you By the put way, a... this is all going. I have it on my other screen, but for people to know each of these uh, calls, it's logging through and showing all this, the hangups, the pickups, the calls. Mm -hmm. So pretty cool. Yeah, and just like anything, you get used to like kind of what it's doing. Like you can see when it's calling out, you can see when it's writing to a voicemail file. You know, there's all sorts of things that you'll start to recognize as you watch that more and more. Mm-hmm. Um, okay, so you've got your two recordings. Let's go ahead and create two general mailboxes, one for sales, one for support. All right. So in that case, we're going to go back to applications. Uh, that's fine. Just hit, uh, save it okay. and hit okay. All right. Oh, you know what? We didn't do that on your first one. We're going to have to re-record IVR closed. Okay. 
let's just do it real quick and get it done. Yep. I'm way faster at it now. Look at this. <laughs> We're closed. Press four. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so name it and save it. Yep. I notice it doesn't like uppercase. It automatically seems to lowercase it, which is fine. Yeah, I don't know why that is. Yeah. All right, so that now that transcodes it into the right format. Um, and now what I would recommend, of course, is when you're actually doing the real recordings, use a good microphone, record it into full wave format, and then you know upload it, and it'll convert it. And that's how I recorded our current system uh, with that. Yeah. I, yeah. I like that you can do that here. That makes it nice. Yeah. Um, OK, so now let's go to uh, Applications Extensions. And again, we're programming in reverse here, right? So we yeah. now have our recordings done that we can use. We're going to create a couple mailboxes that we can use. So just go to add extension and do virtual extension. Uh, whatever extension you want it to be, I usually put you know virtual you know mailboxes as a different kind of number, whatever. But whatever, if you already have the extension plan, just use the same extension. That yeah, you um, with one. It, well, so where one is. Uh... For sales, or is this part? This is no. Not so this isn't that. the this isn't the IVR option. This is an actual extension number for ah, this mailbox. Okay. So um, it could be whatever you want. Yeah, two hundred is perfect. Okay. And they call it you know sales uh, support voicemail or whatever you want to call it. Uh, we'll do support first because that's the first one. Yeah. Support box. So uh, I probably started. Mm -hmm. We'll call it two hundred one. Two hundred one is perfect. Now you don't need a user for the general mailbox. Okay. Just submit. Uh, no, go ahead and uh, cha change. Uh, see where it says create new user down in there, link to a default user. Change that to none. None. All right. And then go over to voicemail tab. Uh, say yes. Give it a voicemail password. And then if you have like a group like support at lawrencetech.com or something that you want to send these to, you can put that in here. Perfect. And then say yes for email attachment. For sure. That's going to be great. And then save that. And let's do the same thing for sales no, no last pass <laughs> uh, virtual extension sales voicemail yes oh wait make sure user yeah, no the user you don't need a user for that guy yep user no and this one can go to sales app. and you'll need a password in there too All right. An email attachment, yes. Uh, yep, yes. Perfect. OK, so now we've got your two voicemail boxes. Um, and again, you know, I, you can clean, go through and clean all this up, but we're just yep. doing it quick and dirty here. Yep, yep. Um, all right, so now the next thing we need to do is uh, you have your ring groups that are going to default, or I think I have a failover destination is going to be those mailboxes. So let's set up your two ring groups. So go to Applications, Ring Groups. Uh, now again, whatever you want to call it, ring group number. Uh, this is the actual extension number. Oh, okay. So, so like uh, just like you made two hundred one and two hundred two, maybe these can be three hundred one and three hundred two. All like right, that. makes sense. Uh, group description, support ring group, or just support ring group, whatever yep. you want to call it. All right. And now here's your extension list. So who's in the ring group right now? You've only got one, right? Yeah. <laughs> so we'll, just, we'll put me in all of them, and I'll. Fix them later. <laughs> if you drop down the quick select on the right hand side there, you can actually go through and pick extensions. And one of the nice things is that the extension will, um, yeah, you don't want the mailbox in there. Yeah. Uh, the extensions will um, be removed from the quick select box after you add them to the group, which is kind of a nice feature. Oh, then we can figure out, yeah, you don't double yeah. add them when we're right. so long. Exactly. Okay. Uh, so then you can do the ring time. Right now it's set to 20 seconds. Uh, rule of thumb is each ring is. Uh, five seconds. So okay. you figure 20 second ring time means four rings. Okay. As you can hear my phone ringing off the hook. I'll put it on do not disturb. <laughs> uh, then let's see, you really don't need to touch anything else in here. Um, a nice setting is like alert info. If you have um, Sangoma phones, for instance, you can choose different ringtones for this ring group. So like you would know if a call is coming in for sales or support based on the sound of the ring. Do the Yaling support that? They do, but you have to create your own alert infos. Okay. So like, uh, it's a little bit of a different process, but yes, okay. they do. Short, short answer is yes. And then destination at the very bottom is going to be voicemail box. 
So this is destination if no answer. Scroll down. Uh, oh, that's what voicemail. And then you've got, so each voicemail box has four different options here. You've got a busy message, an unavailable message, uh, no message, which is beeps, or instructions only. So it's not going to say like, you know, in this case, probably do unavailable. And then you're going to go into the voicemail box for support and record the unavailable greeting. Hey, thanks for calling Lawrence Tech. Uh, we are yeah. unable to get your call at the moment, so please leave a message, blah, 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 right? Or whatever you want to say. Yeah. So now after 20 seconds, if the support people don't pick up, it's going to go to that support voicemail box. Now, interesting thing about the support voicemail box, um, it's not an, a tied to an extension, right? So again, if you're using Sangoma phones, Yaling phones, anything that works with the busy lamp field, you can add that as a button on the phone so that anyone who needs to check the support voicemail box, it'll turn red if there's a message left into it. Makes sense. Or you can just set up email. Yeah. <laughs> Either way. Email is how we like to do. send an yeah. email. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay. So save that one. Let's go ahead and create another ring group extension 302. Uh, did you save that one? Yeah. We... It's submit. Okay. All right. So then 302, this will be for sales ring group. Sailors. Sailors. We'll go with that. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Uh, everything's default. Destination is voicemail. Sales. Sales unavailable. There we go. All right. Okay. So now we've got your basically your option one and option two from your IVR. So let's go to applications IVR. Okay. Add. And we're going to call this uh, open or IVR open, whatever you want to call it. Okay. Description can be whatever. Okay. So announcement. Let's pick our system recording that we recorded. Okay. Uh, enable direct dial is whether or not when someone's listening to that, can they dial your extension directly? And uh, just so you know, you can actually choose a drop down, enable direct dial again. Okay. So it's not showing up, but if you actually create directories, um, like if you go to admin, I think it's admin directories. Okay. Um, they can do the dial by name directory then. Well, not, not that um, it allows you to put in only the extensions you want someone to be able to dial oh, okay. from the outside world. So for instance, um, maybe you have a paging extension that pages everyone in the building and you don't want someone to dial that from the outside world. <laughs> uh, you would exclude that one from the directory, right? So uh, the way you have it here, someone can dial in and hit basically any extension. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So timeout, let's drop the timeout. So this, all of this stuff, here's the thing. This, this IVR stuff is a little bit confusing because there's so many options here. But basically what this is saying is what happens when someone doesn't press a key or presses the wrong key? Okay. So let's say someone's dialing in with a rotary phone. What's the timeout value? So timeout, let's actually bring it down to like two seconds, maybe, maybe three, four seconds. Okay, so basically the notion here is they heard your recording and then we wait for the timeout seconds before we do something else if they didn't press a button. Okay. So in uh, timeout retries down at the bottom, and this drives me crazy because it's a little bit out of order. Uh, go down to timeout retries. This is how many times are we going to keep repeating the recording before they get the hint, right? So usually Got I just it. set that to one. Just retry it one timeout. If they screw it up, we're going to send it a voicemail. Timeout destination down towards the bottom is going to be, where do you want them to go if they've timed out? Probably um, the ring group for support or sales. We actually- or, or one of the mailboxes. Yeah, we actually kill them off because uh, we used to have it doing that. All those scammers, this is how uh, we got rid of them all, was yeah. by, uh, we'll actually tell it to re, uh, repeat twice. Then I'm fine to drop the call after that. So then go to a timeout destination, choose, uh, drop it down. Yep, uh, which is uh, the second from the bottom there. Second, oh, there we go. Um, do what is it? It's uh, try. No, it's not miscellaneous destination. What is it? Terminate call. There it is. Terminate call. Yep. There we go. Hang up. Yep. There you go. That, uh, that's the, another thing preferred. you should do is set up uh, <laughs> Lenny. Lenny is a great spot for those people, uh, and Lenny will take care of them. 
Oh, yes. <laughs> and then you can record it and play it back later and have hours of entertainment. That's, uh, so, that might, we might do that sometime. We get a same, ton of those spammers they, on the spam list called lot. So. <laughs> same with the invalid destination, about halfway up the page, you want to choose. So this is invalid destination is the same thing, but how many times are we trying? Invalid retry is set to like one or two. That's okay. If your options in the IVR are press one for sales or press two for support, an invalid digit is when they press three. Got it. Right, so, so invalid, same thing. Terminate. If they keep hitting the, the the bad digit over and over, what do you want to do with it? Terminate. Call. Hang up. It's fine. Got it. Um, okay. So, and you're more generous than I am because invalid retries. I'm I'm like one. You get one chance of screwing it up. If you don't, you're, you're, you're <laughs> hey, we do retail people still. Yeah. So, <laughs> so there you go. Down at the bottom, let's add our ring group. So press one is going to go to ring group support. Yeah. So uh, ring group. Uh -huh. There, you there go. we go. And Perfect. Add another entry down at the bottom. Uh, oh, yeah. And the big thing that says add another entry. Ring <laughs> <laughs> group uh, sales. And then the other thing you want to account for here is a lot of people, when they hear an IVR, especially if you don't have a receptionist answering first, they start hearing a recording and they just start hitting zero. Yeah. Right? So you usually want to have an option for zero. Uh, if they press zero, where do you want it to go? So they clearly need support. <laughs> uh, I would say sales, honestly. I try to sell them something. Yeah, uh, fair enough. So <laughs> <laughs> let Marvin deal with it. It'll go to Marvin. I'll just put Marvin. Actually, uh, in the options here is a direct, like, yes, you can do extensions. Okay. Uh -huh, cool. Extensions. Any, 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 des any destination later. in the system you can, you can have in the options. Later, that's just, if they just mash in the zero button, they get Marvin. <laughs> right. So now we've got your open IVR all set. So go ahead and hit save. Uh, and there's extra options in there. Also, like on mine, I highly customize it just because I'm a PBX guy. And like I have it. So like if you press an invalid digit, I created a special recording. That's me saying like, oh, you hit the wrong button. You know, try again. We, you know, um, like so, I think we're going to do that. See, this, this is the this is like so far beyond what you can even think about doing a Rean Central. So yeah. uh, I'm, I'm doing it the basics, like how we functionally have things, not how we yeah. want to have them later. Well, and, and it's, it's, it's this project, fun. like anything else, the last 10%, like the details take 90% of the time. Yeah. No, you know I, what I mean? So, I'm predicting some jokes and Easter eggs that are going to be in our phone system for people to find. We're going to make a game of this. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, if you dial mine, I have an option on the IVR to talk to Lenny. So you can just call in and talk straight to Lenny if you feel like it. So See, this is great. <laughs> <laughs> so IVR closed, select your, uh, yeah, description, select your announcement. Yeah. Uh, do you want to still be able to dial extensions after hours? Uh, no, because we want them to just leave an after hours voicemail. For uh, you do got to think about the wife factor, though, if your wife's calling you, but she'd probably just be calling your cell phone, I imagine. You know, she messaged me on Facebook. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So timeout, I would drop that to like, you know, three or four seconds, whatever you want. Yeah, do four. Uh, retries, same thing. So then you just want to set up basically your invalid destination set to terminate call hang up. Uh, your timeout destination set to terminate call hang up. Yeah. Uh, so was it hang up or is it call hang up? Uh, terminate call is the one you're looking for. Oh, where did I miss that? No, you got it. You got it. You were in the right spot. Oh, just, terminate. Yeah, I'm yeah, look, terminate. I was looking for the word hang up. <laughs> there we go. Terminate, then hang up. Yeah. And uh, there's other options in there too, by the way. Yeah, uh, I'll play around with some call, of those. You terminate call and then just drop down the, the hang up box. So can, you play congestion, you give it a busy tone, uh, play ringtones to call her until they hang up. <laughs> 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 call her on hold forever. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, and so here we're gonna do uh, option one, which is, uh, yeah, voicemail support. Yep, yeah, and then unavailable. You could have a different message too. You could use the busy message here if you wanted so that you could have a different outgoing greeting on your support mailbox for day versus night, something like that. Uh, but you've already told people that you're closed anyways. You know what I yeah. mean? So Makes sense though. All yeah, right. And then you'll want to have four. And like I said, if you purchase that VM Notify commercial app, you'll have an extra destination in there called VM Notify and then whichever one, you know, whichever mailbox you set up with for VM Notify. Makes sense. Um, okay, so there we have that. Let's go ahead and do time conditions, and then uh, then we're basically uh, then we just have to do inbound and outbound routing, and we're we're golden. Then we're done. Awesome. Uh, where is time conditions at? Center admin. So time conditions is also under applications, but you actually want to first go to time groups. So there's time conditions and there's time groups. 
Time conditions is the traffic cop. Go this way or go that way, right? Based on the time of day, the time group. So first we can create the time group. Description can be business hours. Uh, when I'm setting up a system, I typically do two nested time groups. The first one is holidays. So I set up my holidays. Uh, and then if, if the holidays are, if it is a holiday, we go to closed. If it's not a holiday, go to the business hours time conditions. Okay, so this one should be holidays first? No, uh, if you want holidays, I didn't set that up. Let's just do regular business hours. You can okay. do holidays on your own later. All right, that's fine. A little, little strap for time. No, so no problem. 10 a.m., uh, time to finish. It's in 24 hour format. Keep that in mind. So you're going to want to do 1900. Yep. You and actually don't need to put in the zero zero. It'll, uh, it'll oh, okay. Also. It just fills it in. Yeah. And then you want to do weekday, Monday through Friday or whatever. Cool. Uh, if you wanted to add more, you could do so. Like for instance, I have a client I just set up where they're open from nine till twelve thirty. Then everyone's gone for lunch from twelve thirty to one thirty, and then one thirty to you know five or whatever. So I had to split it up. I had to add two different ones in there. Yeah. No, we're pretty simple. <laughs> Okay, now you can click list time conditions right there, or you can go to applications time conditions, add time condition. We'll call this business hours. And time group is the group you just created. All right. A little bit further down, third oh. from the bottom. Yep, there's a group. There you go, business hours. So based on business hours, if we match our business hours, we're going to go to IVR open. Else, IVR closed. Simple enough. Mm -hmm. And it gets a little bit confusing when you're nesting time conditions, because if it was the holiday one, you would say, if matches, go to IVR closed, else go to time conditions business hours. Got it. So that way you can set the, I, I see how you. I see how it works yeah, now. Yeah, you're nesting them, yeah. Okay. Okay, um, so now we have that done. Now let's go to connectivity inbound routes. And one thing that we're not even touching on in this video, again, there's this is such a huge topic for EPBX. That's why it's like a 20 part series on my channel. Yeah. Uh, one thing that we're not even touching on is adding a SIP trunk provider. Yeah, I need to do that still. <laughs> yeah. I'm signed so up. Add, <laughs> add inbound route. And now description, just say uh, uh, default, right? Just this is your default route. Now, the next two fields there are how you would actually direct calls to different inbound routes. So you can direct calls based on the phone number dialed, that's the DID number, or the caller ID of the caller. But since we're creating a default route, we're gonna leave both of those blank. So this is sort of the catch-all. If anyone, okay. you know, any number that calls with any caller ID, uh, we're gonna send to time conditions, business hours. Uh, now I get it. I just got ahead of myself there, so time condition. <laughs> Right. Business hours. Yeah. Now I'll throw uh, now if it was if you had holidays, then business hours, you would send to time conditions holidays first. Yeah. And to throw another wrench into the works, something that I will often set up ahead of even the holiday time condition is something called call flow control. Call flow control is basically just a go this way or go that way, and you activate it or deactivate it. So it's for people that don't want time conditions if they want to be able like first person in the morning hits a button on the phone to open the phone system last person to leave hits a button to close the phone system okay right? so you can use a call flow control for that i most often use it if i'm setting up like a school where they need to have a way to press a button to close the phone system for like weather i'm even thinking uh just because of the way we work um that we may Instead of just using our business hours, you may log in and log out of the phone system in general doing that, kind of like to open and close the business. Because sometimes we're here early and we want the yeah. phones to ring early because we're expecting a call. And people, they think nine, we say 10, they think 9.58 and then they leave a voicemail and then we have to right. call them back. <laughs> so my standard caveat with that is that when you set the phone system up that way, you are now relying on humans to open and close the phone system. Uh, can you so have, in, yeah. In, inevitably, you will screw it up. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> you, you will either forget to open it in the morning or you will forget to close it in the evening. Well, and that will happen. cause problems. So in most cases, I very strongly urge people <laughs> to set hours. Uh, oh, set hours. <laughs> yes. Makes sense. Yeah. All right. So we got an uh, and, and if you if you need it open earlier, just change your hours half hour earlier. You yeah. know what I mean? Like if you have people that are calling in at 930, but you're officially open at 10, yeah. whatever, you know, that you might just it happens. <laughs> 
Um, but again, probably a better idea. there's so much custom customization you can do in this system. Um, basically, you can do whatever you want, right? For any client system or any client system that you're going to be installing this for, you'll be able to do whatever they want to do. And it's going to be on a case by case basis. Yeah. And it's, I, I love the idea of the caller ID routing. If, um, so that's a feature built into this. So if it has, if they're calling from a certain phone number, we can actually have it route differently. Mm -hmm. I like that. Yep. If they call one of your DIDs, like, so for instance, I have a special inbound route for my conference bridge. If I'm going to be doing a conference call with customers, I have them dial a different DID. It goes straight into a conference bridge. Nice. Um, or like, you know, it's the, it's the wife clause. If you want your wife's cell phone's caller ID number in there to bring directly to your extension, uh, you can set that up. I, I can see fun as will be had with this. <laughs> yes, absolutely. So let's do this. Pick up your Cisco phone and you can simulate an inbound call even though you don't have a SIP trunk by dialing 7777. That's not doing anything. Go back to the Astros console. Oh, it is doing something. It's playing yep, IVR it closed. Works. Oh, it went to work closed, press four. <laughs> So we did. So we didn't. We did something wrong. <laughs> so okay. So that's probably the um, the time zone. So exit right just in the SSH console. Type exit, and then type date. Yep. What do we see? So we time zone's not correct, right? Yeah. So um, oh, how do we fix the time zone? Uh, I think it's an admin sysadmin, if I'm not mistaken. Let's see, admin. I thought we had it right because we had it set to Detroit. So there's time zone in free PBX and then there's time zone in Linux and sometimes I, Linux doesn't get set. Um, yeah, but think, I bet that's where the problem is. I yeah. think, the, yeah, there it is. Yep. So then we go back and set our America. Do we have Detroit. it? Is it or has it just got Detroit? Yeah. I think there's a Detroit. Yeah, you did try. All right. Yeah. Uh, so save that. You should see server time update right there. That's right. So uh, got to reboot the system. I don't think so. Um, just go back to the SSH console and do date again. Cool. There you go. Okay, so now um, hit 7777, throw it on speakerphone. Yep, actually. Oh, uh, go to asterisk rvvv first, though, so people Yeah, that's what I was actually going to do, so we do yeah, it this right. way. It, it took a second before, so. Because uh, there's a dial timeout, um, you can hit usually hit send, and that'll just push oh, it through. Okay. Well, maybe they're so right about they, rebooting. We get the, yeah, we'll so, get the time so right the, the time's right. It probably just needs to update in the system or something. Yeah, but it worked. <laughs> so there's how you can simulate an incoming call. Now, last thing, let's go ahead and set up your outbound route so that you can dial out. Now, you don't have a trunk, right? So we, have to, right. we haven't set up a trunk, but we can still set up some outbound routes. Uh, that's the outbound call limiting. That's a commercial module. Uh, you just want regular outbound oh. routes. There you go. Okay, so let's go ahead and add the first one. Let's add, let's call this the emergency route. Okay, so we're just going to say emergency. And then click the box that says emergency and the route type. And what that does is it allow it, so you can set an emergency caller ID phone number on a per extension basis. And if someone dials a pattern like 911 that matches this emergency route, it will use their phone's emergency caller ID. Okay, so imagine a situation where you have someone who works from home. Ah. But they're calling out normally with your company telephone number. If they dial 911, it, the authorities would end up at your company, right? So yeah. if they dial 911, we want to use the emergency route to use their emergency DID, which would be their home phone number or like wherever their address is, right? So it sort of just sets it up that way. Um, and again, especially if you're dealing with clients, I cannot overstress the importance of properly setting up E911 for every single extension in the system. Yes, I noticed that when you buy the DID lines, there's an option you set it up in there as well, like when you're who you're purchasing them from, right? The Correct. SIPs. Okay. Yes. Yeah, a lot of that's handled at the so the E nine one one address is handled at the provider level, like your SIP trunk provider, but it's based off of the DID that you're out pulsing, right? Okay. So what what are you where are you coming from? Okay, so let's go to dial patterns, dial patterns tab, uh, and then there's some wizards. So just click the wizard, dial pattern wizard. Right, big blue button right in the center. Oh, okay. There you go. <laughs> and uh, just uncheck everything except emergency and then hit generate routes. Un uh, yeah, so uncheck. uncheck those. Okay. Yeah. There you go. 
and hit generate. And there's all your emergency routes. So it does nine, if you dial 911, 1911, 99111, or 91911, it will go out this route. Uh, 933, that's a test. So a lot of um, providers will have 933 so that you can test your uh, E911 address which, without actually having to call 911. Oh, okay, that's cool. Uh, let's add another outbound route. Uh, we'll call this one default. And notice there's a lot of options here too. Like you can do time zones, uh, you can do um, time groups. So like you can only use this route during certain times of day, things like that. So there's a lot of options in here. Again, way more options than most people ever would use. In yeah. This. Um, now let's click on dial patterns. And um, so let's do dial pattern wizard, uncheck emergency, also check 11 digit patterns and check long distance and generate rips. Okay, so now, seven digit dialing. Okay, so this is the way that it works. So the top one there is seven digit dialing. N means any number one through nine. X means any number zero through nine. Okay, so N X X X X X X is a standard seven digit dial. In most cases, you're gonna wanna prepend. So over there in the prepend field, type one and then your local area code. Uh, but you wanna do it at the second top one. one. Okay. Yeah, there you go. So one and then local area code, so 313, right? Yeah. So now when someone dials seven digits, it's gonna add 1313 to it. Now let's say you had someone who likes to dial nine. Sometimes you have customers, companies that <laughs> they have an old legacy system, they're used to dialing nine. In that case, you would put it in the prefix. Okay, so the prepend is anything that we're going to add to the dial string. Okay. The prefix is anything that we're going to remove from the dial string. Got it. Okay, so when you dial nine plus 10 digits in that case, it's going to only send the 10 digits, it's gonna strip off the nine. Okay. Uh, and you could do some fancy things with this too. Like for instance, if someone dials a 976 number, if you put like 1976 <laughs> NXXXXXX, uh, prefix the entire dial string and prepend like Lenny's extension. Okay. Right? So stuff yeah. like that. You can, you can get pretty fancy with dial. I like it. <laughs> uh, so let's get rid of the nine though. In front of the 10 digit dial, uh, let's go ahead and add a one only. So the 10 digit dial is at the, the second one down there, NXX, NXXXXXX. This, uh, this one here? Yes, so not in prefix, but in prepend. Prepend one. One, yep, so that means if someone dials 10 digits, we're gonna add the one. This one you can leave alone because it's just a standard 11 digit dial. Okay. Uh, the last one though, over in the dial string, put a plus in front of the one. Okay, so the reason we do that is that a lot of phones, such as Yealink phones, when you hit redial on that phone, it will add a plus. I don't know why, but okay. it does. And so that catches, that allows you to now redial from like a Yealink phone. Okay. Uh, now, a couple other things about this page. One thing that this will do is this will also catch all of your toll-free numbers. So if you're dialing 800, 877, 888, this will go out of this dial plan. But sometimes you might want to separate out a toll-free dial pattern, right? You, you, its own route. Uh, the reason that you want to do that is because when you're dialing out, a lot of companies like to outpulse as their caller ID their company's toll-free number. So like if you have a toll-free number for Lawrence Systems, when you call someone, it would show up as 877 call Tom or whatever. You know, like whatever the, whatever your toll-free number is. Yeah. However. If you're out pulsing a toll-free number as your caller ID and you call a different toll-free number, a lot of other toll-free numbers don't accept calls from other toll-free numbers. Oh. So then you want to create a separate outbound route just for dialing toll-free where you're actually out pulsing a non-toll-free caller ID. Okay, that's interesting. Yeah, I found that out the hard way. Wow. <laughs> The really hard way. <laughs> you know, I'm actually seeing less 800 numbers these days. You don't see so, it a lot. You don't no. see it a lot, but it is something that you do run into. And um, I haven't so heard of a 976 number in forever. <laughs> yeah. Uh, one thing I forgot, go ahead and hit save here. Uh, and then let's go back and edit the emergency one again. Uh, one thing I always like to do is click on additional settings and click call recording to yes. Okay, so sense. anytime someone dials 911, we want to record that call. And you can also do the same thing on your default if you're recording calls inbound, recording calls outbound, whatever. Um, if you click, uh, let's go to your uh, edit your default route again, by the way. <clears throat> 
And the one thing we did forget here is the route caller ID. What phone number are we pushing out when someone calls out this dial pattern? Oh, okay. Now do I gotta put a one in front of it or just the digits? It doesn't matter. Okay. Uh, sometimes it matters if your SIP trunk provider only accepts 10 or 11 digits. Um, in most cases though, I just put 10 digits like okay. you did. And I uh, signed and that's up with the, the company you recommended. Oh, cool. So yeah, if you go to, if you edit your default, uh, edit your default route one more time. Sure. There's your primary, secondary, tertiary routes. So trunk sequence for match routes. Once you have a trunk in the system, you will select it down there second from the bottom. Okay. You drop down that box, select your primary route. If you have multiple SIP trunks or if like you have a PRI and you want SIP backup or vice versa, you can have multiple routes in there. And if anyone's unavailable, it'll go to the second one. Okay. And then, um, I, well, I didn't buy anything through them yet. I set up the account and put my credit card in. So I'm <laughs> got that. Well, far. that's, that's a whole different beast. I have a yeah. full documentation on how to set that up. I'll send that over to you. Go. Yeah. That'd be great. Cause that's a uh, kind of next. So what it, I'm in functional question real quick. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'm going to port my number over once I have this tested. So should I go ahead and at least just buy one number from them? Yes. So that's, okay. this is what, so, uh, just for anyone who's watching this in number porting is a, scary thing it is uh, it's something that a lot of people are a little bit um it's yeah you know, I, I don't know it's 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 a very weird process number porting i've um, done it a lot of times <laughs> yeah i have a video on my channel called number porting explained if you guys want to check that out it's a great um, video and, i'll and, link yeah, it in the so description for that <laughs> what i recommend when you're putting in a new phone system is get it up and running get the extensions working get it working the way that you want and then set up, like you said, Tom, get a temporary DID phone number with your provider, set it up, and then forward calls from your old provider. Call them up and say, I would like to call forward all calls from this number to my temporary DID, okay? That way, before you even start the number reporting process, you have a way to test the phone system live. Right. So basically calls will start ringing in live. You can answer those calls. You can send calls. And then if everything's working after a week or two, then go ahead and start the porting process to actually move those numbers over. Yes, that'll be the good news is I only have one number to port over. So good because no yeah. one knows my other DIDs <laughs> and I'm fine. So I'm just going to buy the couple DIDs, port the one main number over and that's it. <laughs> yeah, and the porting process takes usually about two weeks uh, yeah. on average to get completed. That's why I try to get this done now. I have till the end of next month. And... Oh, yeah. Yeah, you're good. Yep. you got plenty of time. <laughs> All right, Tom. Well, that, that about does it. And like I said, have fun, man. There's so many settings and so much stuff you can do. If you have questions, uh, just ask me. I'll check out Crosstalk Solutions. I have full um, tutorial series on FreePBX 13. Um, yes. not, not yet 14, but I'll be doing a new series of 14. I will link to all your playlists so you Perfect. can just click, add them to your queue, and you guys can just watch forever. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of stuff. So each topic that we covered in two hours here, I go into about 15 minutes per, per topic on the, on, the, on the long form videos. I've watched all of them, I think, now. I went through, oh, cool. yeah. I, that's, why, that's why I'm a little bit faster looking through things. I went through all your videos first. <laughs> good. good. Yeah, it's, a lot, it's a lot to learn, but it's nothing scary, uh, no. you know. It's, and 3PPX is a great system. It's like this when you learn PF Sensor first time. You're like, well, there's menus everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, thanks for watching. If you like this video, go ahead and click the thumbs up. Leave us some feedback below to let us know any details, what you like and didn't like as well, because we love hearing the feedback. Or if you just want to say thanks, leave a comment. If you want to be notified of new videos as they come out, go ahead and hit the subscribe and the bell icon. That lets YouTube know that you're interested in notifications. Hopefully they send them, <laughs> as we've learned with YouTube. Anyways, if you want to contract us for consulting services, you go ahead and hit lawrencesystems.com and you can reach out to us for all the projects that we can do and help you. We work with a lot of uh, small businesses, IT companies, even some large companies, and you can farm different work out to us or just hire us as a consultant to help design your network. Also, if you want to help the channel in other ways, we have a Patreon. We have affiliate links. You'll find them in the description. You'll also find recommendations to other affiliate links and things you can sign up for on lawrencesystems.com. Once again, thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.